Audiobooks are more than just an additional format for your books. They're more than just additional platforms for you to make money as an author. Audio is a multitude of possibilities that are limited only by your imagination. Even if you're not ready to spend thousands of dollars on a professional narrator for audiobooks, there's still a multitude of possibilities that exist for you. And AI audio is just one of them. Do you hear what I hear? I hear the sound of opportunity. And that's what you're going to hear in this episode of the Stark Reflections Podcast. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing Podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 259 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this week's episode, it's going to be a solo episode, and I'm going to be doing all kinds of things related to audio. I'm going to be talking about and sharing some sample clips from different audio projects, some AI audio from Google Play, from Descript, as well as some other AI voice projects and work that I have been involved with. I'm going to talk about some audiobook podcasts and clips and things like that, just sort of a variety. So I'm going to just share a bunch of um, compare and contrasts all about audio, but that's what this episode is about. But first, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor, and this episode's sponsor may have something to do with audio, I don't know. Let's hear a little bit about them, shall we? This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a company within the company of Findaway. Findaway is a major distributor of audiobooks. And Findaway Voices also distributes audiobooks for indie authors. That's the way it works brilliantly. Now, Findaway, the company, was acquired by Spotify. Not all that long ago, it was made official. The acquisition has taken place. And in my opinion, this makes it a really great opportunity for Findaway and Findaway Voices to do even more for authors. Now, I equate this to Rakuten purchasing Kobo. When Rakuten, which was a major company from Japan, purchased Kobo in 2012, that gave Kobo all kinds of global opportunities. And Findaway is an amazing company. I had an opportunity to go and visit the good team at Findaway several years ago. I think it was what 2018 2019 i went to cleveland or just outside of cleveland ohio which was only about a four hour drive for me from where i live here in canada get a chance to meet the team and get a tour of the entire operation and facility and i've been using findaway voices since about 2000 and i believe it was 15 i uh, have been working with them i've hired narrators i've found narrators now it's even easier to find narrators through findaway voices you can go to the findaway voices marketplace back in the early days the only option was a manual project managed process where you filled out like an rfp and then they would assign someone on the team to go in and pick five to ten narrators they think you can work with you can still do that or you can diy it to find your own narrator or if you've recorded your own audiobook they even have a blog where they walk you through how to master it, etc., step by step using Adobe Audition. Or if you work directly with professional narrators like I have as well, you can just upload the files directly. I have recently uploaded the file for A Bundle of Fears and Frights, which is basically two of my books. There's a two book story arc in my Canadian Werewolf series. I've got Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, and then Fright Night's Big City. They're two separate audiobooks, but I put the two of them together, called it A Bundle of Fears and Frights, and I've got the audiobook version and the ebook version of that available with additional notes for me as to why and how this two book story arc happened. And what I love about that is it gives me the option. I have the option or 
consumers have the option of purchasing the books independently, but there's also a, a, a deal because it is cheaper to buy the, the bundle to get the two of them at once, but it's a higher price point, which may make it more appealing on other platforms like Audible, etc., because of that $15 credit. And that's one of the things I love about Find Away Voices is I can use Find Away Voices to create and distribute either or my audiobooks in different ways and they're very much all about allowing you to make your own way find your own way on how you get your books out into the market and if you want to see how you can leverage find away voices as an author you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway and now for some comments from recent episodes. So over on the Twitter sphere, I had a, a tweet from Paulette Stout, who's at Stout Content, saying, a fun listening to Mark Leslie on the Stark Reflections podcast. Check it out if you've missed it. And Paulette linked to my most recent episode of the podcast, which was the episode 258, which was the June 2022 Reflective Hangout highlights. And you may remember Paulette from... Episode 223, Love Only Better with Paulette Stout. There'll be a link to that, of course, in the show notes. So thanks for that share, Paulette. Also on Twitter, Lisa M. Lilly, at Lisa M. Lilly, said, Linking to related ISBNs can increase your Google Play box set sales. Also, free content can help sell audiobooks, not just ebooks. Learn this and more from Mark Leslie's Stark Reflection podcast. And Lisa linked to episode number 136, which was back in May of 2020. And this was titled Great Sales at Google with Brian Rathbone. And that was an interview I did with Brian because Brian was really doing well on Google. And I wanted to talk to him and find out how was he doing well at Google. And of course, there'll be a link to that in the show notes. Speaking of Google, I recently, with my draft to digital hat on, interviewed somebody from Google Play, from the Google Play Books Center partner center i should say and uh i can link to that um over at the show notes at starkreflections.ca as well because why not hear from an author about how they leverage google but also hear from someone who works on the google play team so thanks for sharing that lisa and edwin downward at edwin downward at on twitter said the latest stark reflections with mark leslie has me thinking how my moments of doubt as a writer have all been low-key events my passion to write pushed me through there has never been a hard point where I thought I should just quit. And that was in reflection to my reflection of the interview from episode 257 with Naima Simone on writing with heart, humor, and heat. So thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Paulette, for those comments. If you want to leave comments about recent episodes or even earlier episodes that go back to 2020 or earlier, hey, come on, this is the fifth year of this podcast. There are, of course, 259 episodes to comment on, etc. You can do that over at starkreflections.ca or you can leave me a comment over on Twitter. I am at Mark Leslie. And in terms of a brief personal update, I am uh, doing a lot of travel lately, so this week I am going to be camping uh, with my partner Liz. We've got four nights, five nights, so, so many nights at a wonderful campground. I will be doing bits and pieces of work uh, on and off, but because I'm going to be away from most of my equipment, I am pre-recording this on Saturday, July 16th to get ready for the feed for gets into the RS feed on uh, Thursday the 21st in the evening Eastern time zone and then goes live with the show notes at 12.01 a.m. Eastern on July 22nd on Friday. I always call it a Friday podcast release, although although if you are a subscriber, you know, you get it four or five or maybe even six hours earlier. Isn't that exciting? But that's it for the personal update. I'm just going to jump right into the main content, talk a little bit about the audio that I want to dig into and explore with you, dear listener. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to share related to audio is something for people who've never gotten into audio is just how affordable it is to experiment with audio. And I'm going to talk about a few different experimentations. 
I'm going to get into AI later because that makes it really, really affordable, particularly because right now Google Play has the free AI that you can play with. But I want to go back to professional narrators and one of the ways that I've leveraged it. So big challenge for me is that the very first audiobook that I paid to have produced by a professional company, professional narrator, cost me thousands of dollars. And I still haven't earned my money back on that book. That was Evasion, and it was uh, produced in 2013, 2014, and uh, I think it was, what, $3,000 US I paid for that, and I think maybe, maybe I've earned $1,000 back on that, so it's still a far ways away. However, for some of the shorter fiction, I have earned my money back. I haven't made as much money on them, but it didn't cost me as much money. So here's here's the thought. Here's the idea. You take a short story. It's 10,000 words uh, or 5,000 words, let's say, which would be half an hour. It's roughly 9,000 to 10,000 words per hour. So think about a 5,000 word short story would be about half an hour of reading. So if the narrator charges by finished hour, and let's say the charges are $300 per finished hour. You can get an audiobook, a half hour audiobook, a short story for $150. Or if it was $200 per finished hour they charge, you get that for $100. That's a lot more affordable and it allows you to experiment. What I did is I have done quite a few of my audiobooks uh, in short stories and their short story collections. So it may be two or three short stories compiled together. Uh, so it's not as much money. Maybe it's uh, an hour and 45 minutes or something like that. So, you know, I'm paying for less than two hours of professional narrator time. And most of the money, uh, the sales I've gotten from those have not been through the audible places of the world that, you know, requires a $15 coupon or credit payment, etc. But a lot of those have come through library markets where I've gotten the cost per checkout model. And yeah, maybe I'm only getting 75 cents or something poor for a checkout, but I'm getting multiple checkouts and over time that adds up. The other thing you can do is if you do some short stories and have them independently as short stories, they're very cheap, maybe they're 99 cents, maybe they're 2.99, whatever it is that you charge, then you can compile them together. So you can have independent short stories, you can have mini themed story collections, and then you can have larger collections. So for example, I have a mini collection, Active Reader, which are stories about um, books in the book world and, you know, sort of Twilight Zone-ish stories about the book world. And uh, Nick was my narrator for that. And it's three stories. Then I did Night Cries. And uh, I think I had Chris Humphrey uh, do the three stories in there. And then I've got version two of Night Cries, which is another three stories. And then some of them are a combination of Nick or Chris but what I can do is I'm slowly building the library of those short stories and then I can put them together. This is just some examples from uh, Active Reader as well as Night Cries so that you can kind of hear some samples of these professional narrators and the stories. Just going to be very, very brief samples for you. Browsers. The simulation of seeing so many books so suddenly seemed almost more than was good for the frail little boy. George R. Stort, Earth Abides Stepping into a used bookshop is sometimes like stepping into another dimension. Where else but a used bookstore can one find such an eclectic selection of minds and experiences stored in dusty tomes, just waiting to be browsed through by anyone who happens along? Occasionally, a used bookshop can be a painful experience, offering up nothing more than the latest trashy paperbacks and adult porn magazines. But sometimes, sometimes a used bookstore can provide to the avid browser a mystical experience. Sometimes walking through that door, you are overwhelmed with a sense of awe, a sense that something powerful is being housed within the very walls. So there you have Eric Brian Moore. This is from Active Reader, and this was the short story Browsers, which is sort of a Twilight Zone-ish horror tale. And of course, Brian is using the you know professional voice of 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 you know, being a little bit uh, the, the main character, the narrator is a bit of a literary snob, but uh, also he's got that darkness in his voice. You know, very similarly, I have a collection 
and uh, Bumps in the Night, which are stories meant to be read around campfires. And my friend Chris Humphrey, who's also a writer, has uh, done uh, three different versions. This first version you're going to hear is Chris doing his uh, British accent. He also does an American accent, so this is just a sample of the British accent from the story The Shadow Men. The Shadow Men. I'll never forget the night that changed my life forever. It happened in the woods when I was ten years old. It was dark. The air was crispy and chilly. Curious little sounds cut through the night. Small animals rustling in the nearby bushes. The haunting call of a loon on the lake. Leaves whispering in the breeze and the air was charged with the smell of the still-burning embers of a recently doused campfire. It was a night, in fact, not all that different than tonight. Now this next short clip is also Chris from Bumps in the Night. This is Chris doing his American version accent for my horror story, The Pizza Man. The Pizza Man Carl was hovering on the edge of consciousness when he became aware of the faint smell of pepperoni, tomato sauce, and cheese. It was just strong enough to make him realize how long it had been since he'd had a filling meal. And though physically exhausted, having spent the day moving into the old two-story brownstone just a few blocks away from the university, the scent of the pizza kept luring him by the stomach and slowly pulling him out of his sleep. So, only because I mentioned it earlier, I wanted to share a clip from a different narrator, Brian Troxell. And Brian Troxell was the narrator who did my novel Evasion. And that sort of leads to another thing you may want to look at when you're looking at narrators for your book, is I had seen that Brian had done other thrillers. Now, Evasion is a is basically a, a, a thriller. It's got a little bit of science-y elements to it, so you might call it a techno-thriller, but very mild on the tech. Just kind of a thriller. I call it my diehard in an office, and I actually set it in the Kobo building where I was working at the time. I fictionalized it as an insurance office, but I used that building because I was writing it for NaNoWriMo, and I, I didn't want to have to go and look up research. I knew the building because I spent, you know, 80 hours a week in it. But anyways, this is just a short clip of Brian Troxell from the prologue for Evasion, just so you can get a feel for a different voice. Now, I also picked Brian because Brian had other thrillers under his cap, and I knew that in catalogs they may find uh, find the book from Brian, not necessarily from me. And this is because sometimes people really enjoy listening to a particular narrator, and they'll follow a narrator along for a similar genre, just because they enjoy it. So again, here's Brian. Prologue. Three years ago, Scott Desmond was looking at a dead man. He shook his head, swiped at the sweat running down his forehead and into his eyes, tried to focus more clearly on the sight before him. There was no mistake about it. The man he was looking at across two sets of train tracks was none other than his father, a man who had died almost 18 months earlier. Scott shook his head for the second time, rubbed his eyes, tried to focus through the humidity of the August day, but there was simply no disputing the fact. The man he was staring at across the Go Train platform had to be his father. And the last clip from um, uh, Fiction Sharing is one of the audiobooks that I narrated myself, and I normally prefer to use a professional actor, professional narrator to do my books. However, in the case of Snowman Shivers, which is a mini story collection, two short stories, plus a, a bit of nonfiction about am, am, um, uh, anthropomorphic snow creatures, snowmen, basically anthropomorphic means, you know, made after human shape, that kind of thing. Anyway, so I did, I did a history of snowmen, basically. And <clears throat> the reason I did the reading myself was, A, it was short. It was maybe 12,000, 14,000 words in total, so it was relatively short, so it didn't take me as long. And B, I have read the That Old Silk Hat They Found, this uh, short story you're going to hear an excerpt from. I'd read that 
dozens and dozens of times, maybe 30, 40, 50 times to live audience because it's a short story, it's fun, it's family friendly, it's got some humor in it, I can do voices, and it's just one of those stories that I've had so much practice doing that I think even though I'm not a professional narrator, I can probably pull it off. So there will be some short stories that I do the recordings for. Speaking of which, in the notes section for all of my audiobooks, I have the uh, audio, the uh, the author's notes at the end are recorded in my voice because I figure if you're going to hear from the author, why not hear from the author's voice himself? Now, I don't think I did that with Active Reader when, uh, when I had uh, Eric. Eric Brian Moore did that one. That was the first one I did and I didn't realize, but I could go back in because this is the beauty of Find Away Voices is I can go back in and I can replace Eric's version of the notes with my version of the notes. I can just go and swap those files out. Um, and, and I'm just reminding myself now, wow, I don't think I've done that. So anyways, here's just a brief uh, snippet of Snowman Shivers so you can kind of hear me doing one of my own stories. Relaxed in the darkness, I realize that my eyes are closed. What am I saying? I realize for the first time that I have eyes. I open my eyes to see the world through some sort of charcoal gray lens. But despite the blurry gray haze, I can make out a white landscape and figures moving in the distance. Running and cavorting, their shouts are muffled. I can barely hear them. I can barely see. I can barely hear. But I do have life. It's an incredible feeling. Almost overwhelming. I don't really understand who or what I am, but having life feels good. Knowing that I exist and that I can sense and feel is wonderful. I try to move, but I can't. I look down. No! I, I don't have legs, just this, this big round mass. I look to my sides. My arms are mere sticks. They flail uselessly in the wind. Who created me? Who gave me this cruel life? Was it those kids who frolic so joyfully in the snow? It must have been. They're the only other ones here. Can't they see what a horrid creature they have conjured? Can't they tell what a torture this life is that they have given me? Hey! A deep voice calls to me. Who is it that addresses me? Certainly not the children, for they are still ignoring me. The voice sounds much different, much clearer and closer than the voices of the children. My eyes scan the landscape. Hey, you! Newcomer! Finally, my eyes spot the owner of the voice. He is one like me, off to my left. I can tell he is like me because instead of legs and feet, his bottom is a large white mass of snow. He's built like three large balls stacked upon one another. Okay, so that's it for some of the samples of my writing from my voice, from three different professional narrators, and even, you know, Chris doing two different kinds of accents. Now I want to get into the use of AI audio and the opportunities that this prevents, prevents, <laughs> presents. <laughs> that was not a Freudian slip that this presents for authors. And uh, I'm first going to start with a little clip, and this goes back to a previous episode of mine. There'll be a link to the full episode in the show notes. This is an AI conversation that Joanna Penn and I had with one another on this podcast using Descript. Now, this is an AI voice where Joanna and I have spent time training, feeding hours, like 30 hours of our voices, because we have our voices recorded for podcasts, for example, into Descript and then training the machine to sound like us. So this is a conversation, um, AI conversation between myself and Joanna Penn. We are talking about artificial intelligence today because we are both enthusiasts, but there are clearly positives and challenges. What do you think are some of the positive things that AI could bring to authors? I think it could help us with some of the processes that may be redundant or take too much time. If we can leverage those tools for the things that will help us and free us up to do the more human creative stuff, that can be a really good thing. We can get more done. We can create more. We can produce more. Yes, I agree that it's going to help us. And I think AI as a tool is what we need to focus on. In the same way that we do research with the internet, we use Scrivener to write. We use Vellum for formatting. We use the internet and all the wonderful tools like draft to digital and lots of other wonderful companies who help us publish. Without these tools, we would not be able to reach people with our books. 
Think about it as similar to the internet. If we wind the clock back to the internet of 1986, or even 1995, we didn't know then what it was going to turn into. Now the internet is this wonderful, amazing, incredible place that we all spend a lot of time on and use to create and learn and entertain ourselves. And it's also the cesspool of humanity, so we can use it either way. Also, when the ebook came out, there was a lot of fear in the book industry about the ebook killing the print book. But it didn't. It only added to the possibilities of what a book could be. It expanded it and, like vinyl, the print book is still doing well, and also expanding in new formats. So I think that if we approach artificial intelligence with the same optimism, and yet with a bit of caution, we can use it as a tool that benefits us in the long run. I want to be part of the disruption, not be the disrupted. Good slogan. You should put that on a t-shirt. I think being part of the disruption is a really good way to look at it, and also putting a positive spin on creativity. Creativity often involves some form of destruction, and we may have to destroy some of our own practices in order to move into the new way of doing things. Now, as mentioned, that was Joanna Penn and I using our Descript audio book, uh, Descript AI voices that we trained using Descript. And those are the older voices. Those, those aren't the new and improved ones because I haven't had time to go back and retrain my AI, but I know Descript allows you to continue to refine that. I do plan on doing that. And that was from episode 148, which was in August of 2020. So just, you know, kind of early in the, in the pandemic. And that was called AI Voice Double Conversation with Joanna Penn. Now, Another reason why you may want to use an AI voice is an example here, and this is from December 31st, 2021, episode 227, Publishing Trends and Reflections for 2022. Now, I believe I was probably in a hotel room or something and didn't have the right microphone with me. I was traveling. So this is an example of using my voice to do the intro for the podcast because I wanted a quick intro and I didn't want to have a really, really crappy sound. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I have COVID. Maybe I have a really bad cold or laryngitis or something that's affecting my voice. And so potentially I could use that AI voice of my own to fill in for me while, you know, pinch hit for me while I'm not able to properly speak or record the voice. So this is just a sample from the introduction of episode 227 where I did use my AI voice. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 227 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Actually, this isn't Mark. This is my AI-generated voice from Descript. I'm traveling and don't have my fancy microphone with me. So thought I'd use this technology instead of monkeying around with finding a non-echo E spot to record and then transfer the audio. You can hear more of this voice as well as Joanna Penn's AI voice. In episode 148, which is an AI voice double conversation between the two of us, this episode isn't an interview, but a solo reflection. It's the full article I wrote after I had been approached by Clayton Noblet of Written Word Media for an article they wanted to collect picking people's brains about the top eight publishing trends for 2022. The article came out on December 27th, and includes a few quotes from myself as well as Joanna Penn, Mark Dawson, Brian Cohen, Craig Martell, and others. So there, as I said, is a very practical use for AI audio. But I also recently ran into a situation where I needed to make an audio in order to make it more accessible. I had somebody reach out to me who had purchased the print book version of Wide for the Win, which came out in 2020, and they were they were having trouble uh, holding the book, and they wanted to finish reading it, and they said, asked Mark, do you have an audiobook version? And I apologized because... It'd probably take me 80 hours of work to get the audiobook version for this book. It's about, what, 110,000 words or something like that. It would take me forever to do it properly. But what I was able to do when I found out that somebody really wanted to keep reading it and wanted to learn it is I thought, hey, if you don't mind, I'll go and make a version on Google AI. And I made a ver an audio version of Wide for the Win. And I had it live within a couple of hours and I probably could go back and clean up some of the audio, but I wanted to get this out of as quickly as possible for them so they could have access to it. So here's just a quick sample from that. In the general sense of the word for most authors, the term wide refers to publishing an ebook beyond Amazon Kindle. But as you'll see demonstrated through the pages of this book, that's a rather narrow view of the word because it merely refers to a single decision. A simple and rudimentary, either or that's pretty limited in scope. 
it takes a viewpoint that there's Amazon, and then there's the rest. That entire rest is much larger, much more significant, much wider than that overly simplistic viewpoint lets on. Because wide is not a single decision. It's an overarching set of decisions, choices. It's something that is infused into the very core of an author's journey. To me, wide is a purposeful set of decisions, actions, mindsets, and behaviors that an author makes and takes in writing and publishing. It is an approach that considers the long term, considers all options, and considers numerous approaches to cultivating an author career. It is a philosophy, an approach, a way of life for a writer. And as you'll see shortly, it's far greater than just looking at it being Amazon versus everyone else. Because if you only see it as that, you, my friend, are limiting your options. You are, in other words, only seeing a narrow choice rather than a much wider set of options. So that right there was the AI voice mic from Google Play, and authors can use Google Play. If you've uploaded your EPUB to the Google Play Books Partner Center, there's now an option that can allow you to convert that into an audiobook. Now you get a chance to listen to each chapter, it breaks it down, it actually recommends front matter get eliminated, etc. And then you can change it. So for example, in the in the sort of title page area where it says, you know, Wide for the Wind by Mark Leslie Lefebvre, I actually had to go in and change the spelling of Lefebvre to L-E-F-A-V-E, -E, and it comes out fine. If I left it, it comes out Lefebvre or some weird uh, concoction. So you get the opportunity to listen to it, to change the text, to adjust it, to make it work, and then um, you approve it, and then it takes probably, it usually takes uh, usually under an hour, and then you can publish it. And if you publish the book to Google Play, you can download the files and use them yourself. You can sell them directly. Um, what I've also done is, because I know Kobo Writing Life will accept AI audiobooks, I uploaded it to Google, uh, to Kobo, I should say. And uh, that's just another option. So another book that I did, uh, this was nonfiction in that series. And again, because this is nonfiction and it was myself, while yes, I prefer a professional narrator, probably because I do the podcast and I do so much talking about the business of writing and publishing that I thought the audiobooks that I write about the business of writing and publishing should be in my voice as well. But it is time consuming. I did do the audiobook for the very first book in the Stark Publishing Solutions collection of, of six books so far. I did the audio myself. And even though the audio is maybe just a couple hours long, a little more than a couple hours, it's not it's not that long of a book. I think it's about 16,000 words. It was really just a chapter that kind of got out of hand. And well, in the book that I eventually published is Wide for the Wind. <laughs> and so I did the audio version myself, which I sell for full price. I also used a company that Jim Kukrell had um, uh, been part of that did AI audio, and I also have a Google Play audio version. And I think the one with Jim Kukrell was um, very cheap, and the one on Google, I believe, I either made it 99 cents uh, or something like that. Again, relatively cheap. So if you're listening to a computer, it didn't really cost me much, or it was free, therefore I'm going to charge you very little. But for the real professional human narrators, I actually have to charge full price. So now we're going to hear the uh, first clip from the seven P's of publishing success in my voice. And then we're going to hear the same clip in the um, Brian, which is the AI voice. And then the third clip will be Mike, who you just heard, who did Wide for the Win as well. Practice. The first element of publishing success falls in line with what might be the most common advice that successful authors from both traditional publishing and self-publishing share when asked by beginning writers. First, Write a good book. Practice. The first element of publishing success falls in line with what might be the most common advice that successful authors from both traditional publishing and self-publishing share when asked by beginning writers. First, write a good book. Practice. The first element of publishing success falls in line with what might be the most common advice that successful authors from both traditional publishing and self-publishing share when asked by beginning writers. First, write a good book. So there you can see three different versions of the exact same book in three different voices. My human voice, Brian from 
AudioVox, and Mike from Google AI. Now, I have a series of books called The Canadian uh, Werewolf, and uh, the very first short story that kicked off the creation of the series was a 10,000-word short story called This Time Around. And This Time Around got readapted into what became roughly the first five chapters of the novel A Canadian Werewolf in New York. It's, it's a little bit different because I modified it uh, a bit, but you know a lot of the same things happen. And what you get is This Time Around is available on ebook for free. Now, obviously, the print version and the audiobook version cost money because they cost money to produce. And I use that as a, as a lead-in because if somebody can listen to the story for free, or sorry, they can read the story for free, and if they like it, then potentially they'll want to see what happens in the whole rest of that person's day in A Canadian Werewolf in New York. So the audiobook on the various retail library platforms costs money. It's about 56 minutes long, so and it did cost me money. I had to pay Scott Overton, the professional narrator who did, uh, who is the voice of Michael Andrews for those books. I had to pay him. Therefore, I needed to sell it for a price. But because the ebook is a loss leader for me, it's one that I want to use to hook people into the series, I wanted to make the audio available for free. So I took the audio from the book that Scott narrated for me and I loaded it to YouTube, which is a you know search engine discoverability platform, and made that available for free. But what I also did more recently was I went and I did a Google AI version as well, and I made the Google AI version free. Again, same idea. Here's the AI version of the story. You can listen to it if you like it. Well, you can actually hear a, a human narrated version. Uh, they're available for sale. What I might do is I might make Google AI or other AIs that become available versions of the book as well. And so, again, you can purchase the audiobook for full price for, with a professional narrator, or you can purchase the AI version, which is a limited price. Again, giving consumers choice and options but also in ways that don't take away from the authentic experience of listening to a human narrator. So again, makes it more accessible to more people, maybe more affordable for some people, but then there's also the quality version that is still available. So here's a sample of Scott Overton reading, the human narrator, the professional narrator, who is the voice of Michael Andrews for my Canadian Werewolf series. And then following that will be Mike, the AI version of that. This time I woke to find myself sprawled naked in the grass, my shoulder nestled in a shrub, and the coppery aftertaste of blood in my mouth. It was a cool morning, but humid, the unmistakable scent of the Hudson River hanging in the air. I pulled my aching body into a sitting position and checked it over for injuries. Apart from the usual scrapes and scratches, there was a nasty-looking wound in my thigh. It hurt like it was no more than a bad bruise, but it looked like a bullet hole. I ran my hand down the leg and stuck my finger inside. Yes, indeed, it was a bullet hole. The bullet was nestled just about an inch deep. At least the bullet wasn't silver. Now that I would have felt. So to sum up my situation, there was a distinct taste of blood in my mouth and a bullet wound in my leg. What the hell had I done this time? This time I woke to find myself sprawled naked in the grass, my shoulder nestled in a shrub, and the coppery aftertaste of blood in my mouth. It was a cool morning, but humid, the unmistakable scent of the Hudson River hanging in the air. I pulled my aching body into a sitting position and checked it over for injuries. Apart from the usual scrapes and scratches there was a nasty-looking wound in my thigh. It hurt like it was no more than a bad bruise, but it looked like a bullet hole. I ran my hand down the leg and stuck my finger inside. Yes indeed it was a bullet hole, the bullet was nestled just about an inch deep. At least the bullet wasn't silver. That, I would have felt. So to sum up my situation, there was a distinct taste of blood in my mouth and a bullet wound in my leg. What the hell had I done this time? And finally, since we're using an example from Scott, um, the latest book in the Canadian Werewolf series, Lover's Moon, is a dual narrated book. Even, even in the writing, all of the books so far are first-person perspective from the main character, Michael Andrews, 
But book five, Lover's Moon, which is a romantic comedy or a paranormal romantic comedy, is told in alternating chapters from Michael's point of view, just like normal, and then Gail's point of view, female character, his love interest. So because Scott has long been the voice of Michael Andrews, it makes sense that I get Scott to do the Michael chapters, but I was looking for a narrator for Gail and uh, Sarah Sampino, who I've had on the podcast. Uh, I'll link back to the episode she was in. I hired Sarah to do Gail's voice. Now, Scott has finished the recording of the Michael chapters, and and so the recording is such that uh, Michael's first-person perspective, Scott reads, and obviously Sarah reads Gail's first-person perspective. However, when there's dialogue involving Michael or Gail, it's going to be in the voice of Scott or Sarah. It's going to be in Michael's voice or Gail's voice, just to make that a little bit more multidimensional. And so Scott has recorded all his bits, which are his chapters, as well as his dialogue bits, and I have that. But Sarah just got back from her honeymoon, just got married, and so she, based on her schedule, wasn't going to be able to start working until probably late July over August. So I know I'm not going to have the audiobook, the official professional narrator audiobook ready until probably September. But in the meantime, Julie and I had such a fun time with it, and I wanted uh, to, to, to try something different. So uh, Terry Fallis, who again was interviewed on this podcast, I can link to his episode in the show notes. He has podcasted his own books, and he started off self-published. He uh, used a podcast, a serialized podcast for his book, The Best Laid Plans. It later won Stephen Laycock Award, and it got picked up by McClellan and Stewart, which is a, a, a imprint of Random House Canada. And he's done, I think, eight, nine books now with Random House. And so he's done very, very successfully. And he's also recorded the audiobook for all of them. And so I thought, following sort of Terry's thing, uh, let's podcast this as weekly episodes where I read Michael's chapters. And I had to convince Julie Strauss, who has a podcast, a great podcast, the um, best book ever podcast, which is awesome. And I got Gail, I got her to do Gail's voice. Now, she was very reluctant to do that, but I actually think she's done a, a brilliant job. So what we're doing is every week we're rolling out chapters. I think... The latest chapter is seven. It's only the book's only been out for seven weeks. I know if you've been listening to the podcast religiously and every week you're like, oh my god, he's been talking about this forever. But it's only been out for seven weeks, I think. And so we got the weekly podcast coming out. What we are going to do is once we get caught up, we've only gotten I think up to chapter nine or chapter ten that we've actually got the audio for. But we want to get um, try and get caught up towards the end of the summer get all the audio out and so there will be two versions of the audiobook out there will be the official full price professionally narrated version that obviously costs us a, a decent chunk of change but then there's going to be the read by the author version which is probably not going to cost as much because neither julie nor i are professional narrators now we are professional podcasters but we are not professional narrators or actors so again it's probably not going to be of the same quality as the stuff that Scott and Sarah are doing. But again, it's the great thing about audiobooks is you can have multiple versions of audiobooks. You can have dramatic readings, you can have plain readings, you can have single narrator, you can have multiple narrator. It's not just, there's as many formats of audio as you can conceive of, just like you have a hardcover, trade paperback, mass market, etc., a large print, you know, four different types of print books. You can have multiple different versions of audiobooks, just so long as you're very, very clear to the reader. Hey, this is an AI version. This is a human narrated version. This is a professional narrated version. This is read by the authors. That kind of thing. As long as you're clear to the potential reader or listener, you're not really hurting anyone. So here is an example of Scott's reading of chapter one. Saturday, May 21st, 2011. Chapter 1. Michael, 11.52 a.m. The scent was beyond intoxicating. It was so compelling, in fact, that I could almost feel myself getting turned on, and I hadn't even seen her yet. The fragrance of basil, oregano, rosemary, and thyme mixed with garlic permeated the air. Antonio's Urban Kitchen was the kind of place that would make you hungry regardless of your condition when you walked in. 
You could have just come from either a marathon session at an all-you-can-eat buffet or finishing a winning run at Nathan's annual hot dog eating contest on Coney Island and still find yourself suddenly overwhelmed with hunger pangs. And while the food here was amazingly delicious, the smell of the place was out of this world. So there you have the beginning of Chapter 1, read by Scott Overton, professional narrator. And now I'm just going to do just the very beginning of Chapter 1, in my voice from the podcast, and because it's a podcast, we have the intro music, etc. So um, just uh, I'll play that clip now. Lover's Moon, a novel by Mark Leslie and Julie Strauss, read by the authors. Saturday, May 21st, 2011. Chapter 1. Michael. 11.52 a.m. The scent was beyond intoxicating. It was so compelling, in fact, that I could almost feel myself getting turned on. And I hadn't even seen her yet. And likely spending the rest of the daylight hours sitting in my apartment alone in front of a keyboard and a blank page, wondering... What the hell was wrong with me, all the while waiting for the secret society of manly men to take away my man card? You've been listening to Lover's Moon, a paranormal romantic comedy by Mark Leslie and Julie Strauss, read by the authors. Lover's Moon is book five in the Canadian Werewolf series, published by Stark Publishing and available in print, ebook, and audiobook. The music used in this production, Waltz Primordial by Kevin MacLeod featuring Alexander Nakarada, was licensed via Incomptech.com and is copyrighted by Kevin MacLeod. And so that's it for the audio clip sharing of this clip episode? Clip episode? What do we call this? <laughs> this is basically... Uh, Do You Hear What I Hear was what I thought I would title this uh, podcast. I did do back in um, trying to remember when I did that, checking the little notes that I have here. I did do an episode on um, episode 63 back in 2019, February 22nd of 2019, episode 63. I did an episode called Wait, Did You Hear That? All about audiobooks. And yes, there is a Robbie Robertson reference in there because, you know, I can't resist those earworms. But I thought I would focus again on audiobooks for this complete episode because I wanted to share some of the things that I've been talking about on this podcast. I wanted to talk about it, but also give you examples so you can kind of contrast and hear the different versions. But more important than that, what I really, really want you to walk away from is the understanding that there's so many variances, there's so many nuances, there's so many opportunities and options and experiments that you can do with audiobooks. And I hope you've walked away from this episode with some ideas on how you might be able to leverage some of those opportunities, some of those tools, some of the technologies for your own awesome author journey. Well, that's it for episode 259 of the Stark Reflections podcast. I want to thank you so much for listening. And I want to thank all of the people who support this podcast over on patreon.com, patreon.com slash Stark Reflections, with a special thank you to my patrons. And a reminder, because I did share this in the patron channel, that we are doing another hangout. The July hangout for patrons is taking place on July 23rd, 2022. And I'm looking forward to hanging out with you and chatting with you there. I'm also looking forward to getting the next episode out, which will be episode 260, and it will be happening next week because there is always an episode week since this podcast started five years ago. Thank you so much for listening. You can support the podcast either via the Patreon that I mentioned before. You can leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice because reviews do really honestly help. Thank you so much for everyone who has left reviews. And you can also share the podcast with someone that you think would find value in one of the stark reflections of the 259 episodes so far. So thanks again for listening. Until next week, 
And next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre asking you, do you hear what I hear? But also wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.